everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, you have reached today's session that covers local education agencies and DPs, the requirements um, as it relates to AHERA. And this is part two of a four part series, the AHERA Designated Person Training Series. My name is Kara Bell. And on behalf of EPA, I welcome you, EPA and the um, AHERA Center for Excellence, I welcome you to the training today. Today, you're going to learn about the requirements um, as an LEA DP um, as it relates to AHERA. You're also going to learn about the development of your asbestos management plan, a key component um, as a DP. The training is based off of the EPA guidance, how to manage asbestos in school buildings, the AHERA designated person training study guide. We encourage you to review this document along with viewing this training um, that you're receiving today, as well as the other sessions. You will need to refer back to this guidance um, quite often. Um, there's a lot of information that you will receive today so being familiar with the document and where to go to um, to refresh your memory um, will be most helpful as a DP. Um, and now at this time, here's the website uh, before I move on. If you have any um, questions that, as it relates to the training, you can reach me at the r5ace at epa.gov. You can email me as well as um, find more information at our asbestos and school building site. Um, now I'm going to pass the mic um, to uh, my forever grateful <laughs> to have as a colleague, Kristen Gendry, um, who will introduce our two speakers. And I'm Thanks, going to Kara. start sharing my, uh, hi, I'm going to stop sharing my slides so that they can see you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah, so I am the region, the EPA Region 8 Asbestos Coordinator, and since both of our speakers today are hailing from Montana, which is in my region, I get the pleasure of introducing them. Um, so today we have uh, John Podolinski. He is the Montana Department of Environmental Quality small business ombudsman. Uh, John started his asbestos and environmental career in the 1980s as an industrial hygiene consultant in the Midwest, working with schools and industry. Uh, John and his family moved to Montana almost 29 years ago, where he's been employed with Montana DEQ ever since. He ran the asbestos control program, administering state asbestos and EPA's asbestos NESHAP regulations. He was a project officer on the Libby Asbestos Superfund site and currently assists small businesses with navigating environmental regulations as a small business ombudsperson in the Small Business Environmental Assistance Program. John is excited to be here and we are really excited to have him and for him to share his asbestos knowledge and experiences. Uh, and then we also have Annette Satterley she is a fifth generation Montana native. She obtained her accreditation as an asbestos inspector and management planner in the early 90s. She likes to point out that she's been in the crawl space and attic of most of the public schools in the state. So a good person to have on our call here. She has almost 30 years of workers compensation experience, the last 24 with the Montana School Boards Association and Montana Schools Group Interlocal Authority. Annette holds a Bachelor of Science in Occupational Safety and Health, Science and Engineering, and a Master of Science in Industrial Hygiene from Montana Tech. She also holds her certification as a Certified Risk Manager, a Certified Insurance Counselor, and a Certified School Risk Manager, and as a Certified Playground Safety Inspector. Uh, she likes to refer to herself as a safety geek and insurance nerd. Uh, and Annette is very honored to be here. We are super excited to have her, uh, excited to hear about a topic that she holds near and dear, and um, really just super lucky to have the both of these speakers here today to share their experiences. So um, with that, I will let you all kick it off. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Preston. That was a very nice introduction. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Kara, for uh, uh, having us talk. We're both very honored to present in front of the United States on behalf of the AHERA Center for Excellence. Did I get that right? Center for AHERA Excellence? <laughs> um, and we're going to kick this off right away. Um, and we can go to the next slide. I'm not sure how many people attended uh, Rich Ponax and Dr. Arthur Frank's um, um, presentation on Friday, but they did an excellent job in introducing the AHERA regulation um, as well as asbestos basics. And then uh, Dr. Frank uh, talked about the asbestos exposure health risks, which was fascinating. Um, yeah, I got a very uh, nice, uh, um, what, the, the presentations were very pleasing because of a lot of the pictures and both of those people are really do really well at what they do. So yeah, Friday's presentations were, were awesome. Today's presentation will cover local ag education agency, uh, designated person and management plan requirements. Um, and as Kara said earlier, refer to your uh, self-study guide. This is very important, very useful. We'll also refer to the actual regulation itself. Uh, AHERA being an act, the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act was promulgated by Congress years ago and it mandated EPA to write the asbestos containing materials and school rules. And that's this particular document here. Another handy document is the 100 commonly questions uh, asked of the AHERA as well. That's a, a, a nice document as well. We can go to the next slide, please. All right, no presentation is uh, fulfilling unless you go through some acronyms and definitions. So certainly AHERA stands for the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act, which promulgated the asbestos in school rules. Um, asbestos containing materials, as most of us know, are any materials that contain more than 1% asbestos by polarized light microscopy. So that's a geologic type microscopy technique to determine um, how much, well, whether or not the materials or fibrous components in a sample of building material um, uh, are asbestos. And then the next step is to determine the, the quantity of asbestos uh, in that particular sample. Um, a lot of people think that materials that contain 1% or less asbestos are not regulated, but that's not the part, that's not the point. Um, OSHA still regulates materials that contain any amount of asbestos. Um, so you want to pay attention to those regulations as well. Um, AHERA was really, really groundbreaking in the late 80s. It uh, really formulated the regulations um, and it really built a big industry as consultants and contractors, laboratories, and it really built the framework and was landmark in terms of establishing asbestos uh, once again, I want to say. And it's all about controlling fiber release in schools and reducing risk to uh, schools as well as other building occupants um, and uh, not having kids get exposed to asbestos because we all know that when you get exposed to asbestos there's a possibility of coming down with an asbestos related illness as Dr. Frank talked about on Friday and um, yeah some of those exposures can be really uh, detrimental and very sad when you lose somebody that has, has died from that so um, these regulations are all about trying to prevent that sort of thing, so we're not all sad. <laughs> but in the AHERA regulation, they came up with a lot of different different definitions um, that can be kind of confusing. Um, but, you know, jumping from ACM to ACBM, um, AHERA took the step of saying that asbestos containing building materials are thermal system insulation, such as pipe and boiler insulation, tank insulation, uh, and vessel insulation. Uh, we call it TSI, another acronym. Uh, surfacing materials are anything that you can trowel on or spray on, such as fireproofing or wall plaster. And then miscellaneous are typically uh, floor tiles, ceiling tiles, and such materials as that. But here again, came out with a lot of um, new definitions, and uh, we're going to go over more of these as we go along. Accredited, in my world, in my experience, a lot of people simply do not know what accredited means, but that's just a fancy word for license. And initially EPA was licensing individuals to become either workers, contractors, supervisors, inspectors, management planners, and project designers. And then there's a sixth accreditation in the model accreditation plan called the Project 
monitor, which a lot of states have adopted, uh, but in places like Montana, we have not adopted that particular accreditation. But the accreditation is based on training. So asbestos uh, training course providers were approved by EPA as well as states now. Many, many states have adopted the model accreditation plan, which you'll find in Appendix C of the HERA regulation. And it's up to those states and EPA to uh, verify that people are trained and then certify that you actually have a certificate that you pass the class. Um, and uh, then with that, you can get licensed through either the state or through EPA, depending on where you live. Um, as I mentioned, the model accreditation plan, a uh, very, very important plan found in Appendix C. If you have a chance to read that, that uh, we'll talk about when you go to class, what you need to learn. Um, in the AHERA regulation and the asbestos containing materials in schools uh, rule, they talk a lot about damaged ACBM definitions. In fact, there are five of them. And it's all about accessibility, our kids, our students, our teachers, uh, building occupants, um, accessible to uh, asbestos containing building materials, and then trying to figure out that risk uh, related to uh, fiber exposure. And if there's high risk, if materials are damaged, significantly damaged, or there's a potential for damage, then there's options for the school district, the LEA, to, to uh, respond, called response actions. Um, and uh, repair or clean up those particular situations. Friable asbestos containing material, I believe that tech, that term came from the Asbestos National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants. The NESHAP is another regulation that, uh, actually a host of regulations promulgated by EPA back in the 80s and the 90s and still promulgating, but there's over 187 uh, hazardous air pollutants of which asbestos is one of those and it's regulated under the specific asbestos NESHAP regulation. So in that regulation, there are definitions. One is friable ACM, which is when a material is dry, the material can be crushed under hand pressure, pulverized, or reduced to powder, as opposed to non-friable ACM, which means when dry ACM, that cannot be crumbled under hand pressure. Um, Typically, uh, friable asbestos containing materials, as Rich pointed out last week, are pipe and boiler insulation, fireproofing, ceiling panels, and non friable materials are largely floor coverings, uh, transite, which is a trade name for cement asbestos board, as well as cement asbestos pipe and other materials made out of cement and asbestos, um, as well as asphalt roofing. Next slide, please. HEPA. Uh, or HEPA, depending on how you want to pronounce that, is a high efficiency particulate air. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an air filter that's capable of removing 99.97% of particles that are larger than 0.3 microns. Um, a lot of times we see these in these large air cleaning devices. We'll, we'll put those HEPA cartridges on our, our respirators as well and it protects ourselves from being exposed to asbestos. Another interesting uh, term or definition in the HERA was the homogeneous area. And all that is is an area of materials that are similar in color or texture. So when I look at the suspended ceiling panel and panels in here, they all look the same. They all have the same color, the same texture, and I would call that a homogeneous area. Okay? And there are specific regulations or guidelines in the regulations that talk about how many samples need to be collected of those particular materials. A local education agency, I'll touch in the next slide on what that is. Um, the NESHAP, as I explained before, is the National Emission Standards for Hazardous Air Pollutants. Uh, PCM stands for Phase Contrast Microscopy. That's a technique that we use to analyze air samples that might have been collected um, after a smaller response action under 160 square or 260 linear feet. Whereas once you get into larger removal projects or response actions, then the school district will have to look at doing transmission electron microscopy on the analysis of those samples as well. As I mentioned before, PLM stands for polarized light microscopy. Uh, response action is simply an asbestos abatement method uh, such as repair, O&M, removal, enclosure, encapsulation, those sorts of things. And folks that do that sort of response action, any of those response action have to be trained. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of getting a 14 plus 2 
16, two plus two or 14 plus two hours for <laughs> training to do small scale, short dura duration work, all the way up to 40 hours for a contractor supervisor. And as I mentioned before, TEM is a transmission electron microscopy. It was interesting, uh, one of the companies I worked for in the Midwest actually had one of these uh, microscopes and yeah, pretty fancy. And interestingly enough, years and years ago, it was really, really expensive to have a, an air sample analyzed by transmission electron microscopy. But the huge benefit is that when the microscopist looked at a fiber, they actually hone in on it and determine whether or not the fiber was asbestos, what type of asbestos was it, um, as well as other fibrous constituents as well. Next slide, please. All right, a local education agency, right out of the regulation in the definitions, is any local education agency is defined in section 198 of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. For the most part, it's a school district, public and private schools, kindergarten through 12. And that's probably the most generic way that we can describe um, what a local education agency is. A school is any place that we're educating kids, a gymnasium, a maintenance area, a cafeteria, and there's a laundry list of what type of buildings or what functional spaces um, are part of a school. And then if you're in the military, um, the school would be uh, governed under the Defense Dependence Education Act. But all of the schools in the United States K through 12 public and private need to follow the AHERA regulation. Next slide, please. All right, LEA responsibilities in section 763.84. There's a laundry list of things that the local education agency needs to be or do. And a lot of times the local education agency might be the, the school board. Um, and that's largely what I've run into in the past is usually it was a school board that was the local education agency. I'm sure there's others as well. Um, but number one, the LEA is uh, obligated to ensure that school asbestos actions are performed in accordance with the AHERA regulations, with the ACM um, regulations for schools. There's a requirement to train custodial and maintenance staff because they're the folks that are on site. So. As Rich talked about last week, if you had a leaky pipe uh, valve or something like that and the knuckle, the insulation, if it contained asbestos, were to delaminate or fall off, a trained custodial and maintenance staff would respond to that material and do what's called a short scale, short term, small scale, short term <laughs> um, work. And that those individuals have to be trained appropriately in order to do something like glove bagging is one way of dealing with removing uh, pipe insulation. So training the custodial and maintenance staff are way up on the list. There's an annual requirement to notify building occupants and parents. Okay? It has to be in writing. It has to be documented. In fact, even if you don't have a, if you have a school that's new or say you've removed all the asbestos materials, that's still a requirement to notify parents and occupants on a regular basis um, that you took uh, proper procedures to um, abate the asbestos or even to remind them that uh, we have a certificate from an architect and an exclusion that the school is asbestos free. There's an obligation to inform outside contractors of asbestos containing building materials. Again, OSHA has a very similar requirement in their hazard communication section of their asbestos construction standard. And again, you don't want contractors that are coming in from out of out of the building, such as electricians or plumbers or heating and ventilation folks, and not knowing what they might be dealing with. Because again, the, in my experience, they can cause some real havoc <laughs> um, if they do impact asbestos containing materials in an improper manner. There's a required to post warning labels in, in, a, in uh, adjacent to asbestos containing building materials and maintenance areas such as boiler rooms, heating and ventilation rooms, um, and other maintenance areas. So the first slide that had a picture of the um, caution label that is the warning label that needs to be posted um, next to or on in many cases on the insulation the management plan that um, annette will talk about needs to be available in each school and it needs to be up to date it is the um the it's the working document that the work that we're all uh, relying on 
Um, and then lastly, the LEA needs to address any conflicts of interest. And the largest conflict of interest that we might run into is if you have an asbestos contractor and they want to do their own uh, final air clearance testing or their fi own visual inspection, that is prohibited because you don't want that conflict of interest. You don't want the fox guarding the hen house per se. And uh, it's very clear in the regulation that a third party be hired to do this final visual as well as the air testing uh, by, the by the designated person. And it could be the LEA for that matter. Um, just as so long as that, that third party is doing the testing and make sure the building is clean or the work area is clean and that air samples pass uh, criteria. Next slide, please. Again, going on uh, to LEA responsibilities, there's an inspection requirement. So initially, back in the late 80s, every school in the United States was obligated to be inspected for ACBM, and that had to be done by an accredited asbestos inspector. Every three years from that initial inspection, there was an obligation to re-inspect, again, by an accredited asbestos inspector, somebody who's a card-carrying member who does that inspection and writes out that information. There's an assessment requirement, so the inspector is obligated to assess the quality or the condition of the asbestos containing building materials and actually write out how they feel or think about building materials that they've done their inspection on. And then all that information gets put into the management plan and a uh, response action uh, uh, menu is drawn up per se. Um, so the management plan is written by an accredited asbestos management planner <laughs> and I would imagine Annette probably has all of the accreditations. Um, response actions as I mentioned before is essentially abatement by accredited personnel and testing. Okay? You've got O&M to take care of issues where you suspended ceiling panel gets damaged by uh, water and falls on the ground. You want trained individuals to deal with that all the way up to a contractor supervisor and workers who might be doing full-scale removal, encapsulation, enclosure, repair, and the list goes on and on. Operations and maintenance, um, again, by trained maintenance personnel, we call those small-scale short duration type work, uh, where a person's obligated to get 14 hours of hands-on training, and then at least two hours of an asbestos awareness class. Frankly, in my, in my experience, a lot of school districts will send um, some of their custodial staff to either worker or contractor supervisor class just so they're covered a little bit more um, to gird themselves from other regulatory authorities. Um, but yeah, no, my feeling is you can't get enough training in this particular field. As I mentioned before, the training of approved training course providers was obligated in the model accreditation plan. All states were obligated to uh, adopt the requirements of the model accreditation plan. But those are the worker folks. They're the, 30, they're the 32 hour trained people that are doing the actual removal of asbestos materials and other response action. A contractor supervisor is a 40 hour trained person and they're essentially the competent person on site and they oversee the workers as well as other contractor supervisors on the job site. The inspector does the initial asbestos inspection in schools as well as the re-inspections. A management planner writes the management plan that everybody is supposed to follow. A project designer, uh, writes the design for the instructions on how an asbestos contractor would do a response action. And then the last uh, sixth uh, accreditation, which very, isn't very popular, it is in certain states such as California, the project monitor would be hired as this third party air testing or, or um, consultant that would oversee the contractor doing his or her work. An annual notification to occupants, parents, outside contractors. That's very, very important. And again, as I mentioned before, that needs to be documented in, in writing. That can be through the newspaper, could be through the union newspaper, um, flyers, uh, direct contact with parents and that sort of uh, communication. There's a requirement for every six months that a trained custodial staff person do what's called a periodic surveillance. That person wants to take a look at the most recent asbestos inspection as well as past asbestos inspections and go around and look at all the asbestos containing building materials that have been identified and look at what condition they are. And if they've changed, then that periodic surveillance is supposed to document that and that information is supposed to be conveyed in the management plan. Record keeping is incredibly important. 
If you don't have documented what you've done in your school, then it didn't happen. You know, being a past regulator, um, it was it, it was it was pertinent. It was very important that contractors and consultants and building owners and schools document essentially everything they do with asbestos in order to stay out of trouble. Lastly, there are warning labels, as I mentioned before, that need to be posted immediately adjacent to asbestos containing building materials in maintenance rooms. Next slide, please. The LEA, um, or I should say the designated person is typically appointed by the LEA. They have a lot of special powers <laughs> and they essentially quarterback the management plan and a hero requirements. Um, I can't say enough about a good management um, plan as well as a designated person that knows that plan well, typically adequately trained, um, means more than just going to an awareness training class, but possibly being uh, trained and certified and accredited. Um, being a designated person is, is a big role. Uh, we here in Montana periodically see schools fall off the Ahira uh, wagon and uh, fall into trouble uh, with the regulations and in some cases um, have issues with not managing asbestos properly. Um, so that designated person is really the, the key person that, that we rely on, uh, not only in, um, in, the, in the AHERA regulations, but also state regulations, asbestos NESHAP, and even OSHA for that matter. That person is really important. So that person is responsible to maintain the management plan, the testing of response actions and determine whether or not a response action is complete. Um, and then they need to work closely with the LEA to make sure that when a project is being contemplated that we got some money set aside in order to do it properly. And really a competent DP protects the school district, the LEA from asbestos risk and potential regulatory citations. Next slide, please. Real life experiences. Um, I could go on and on and on just from the past experience on this, but uh, yeah, I totally sympathize with contractors and, and schools and building owners that these regulations are not very easy to follow. They're confusing. Some of them actually conflict. Um, in some cases, the, 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 the marriage of regulations do really well and other times they don't do so well. Um, and uh, that's, you know, it, it, for many, many years, a lot of us has, had always hoped that EPA or, <laughs> or whoever would just write one big regulation, we would just follow that. And that would apply to all buildings in the state, in the United States. But no, it doesn't seem to be that way. It's not that way. Um, and that's just life. Um, as I suggested or mentioned before, the EPA asbestos NESHAP largely governs the demolition and renovation of facilities, public and commercial buildings in the United States. It also deals with the disposal of asbestos waste. The, this particular regulation under Code of Federal Regulations, Part 61, Subpart M, I'm assuming that a lot of you are familiar with this. Again, requires an asbestos inspection, a thorough asbestos inspection um, of the affected area of the facility that's gonna be renovated or demolished. Um, and a lot of times states require that that inspector be accredited again, just like the asbestos inspector in the HERA regulations. Um, and some states like Montana have gone far enough to really lay out what the requirements are for that asbestos inspection. For the most part, the asbestos NESHAP talks about reducing or preventing the emission of asbestos by the use of water, by the use of engineering controls. And the goal is to stuff all those little asbestos fibers into the big yellow bags, actually into leak type wrappings and get them disposed of properly. And then following record keeping and all this manifesting uh, requirements as well. OSHA um, has three different regulations that deal with asbestos. And what we deal with primarily in schools is the asbestos construction standard. In 29 Code of Federal Regulations, 1926, 1101. That's where we get our types of classes of work. Um, and it goes on and on about work practices, depending on the type of building materials you're working with, to uh, respiratory protection, to medical surveillance, to it goes on and on and on. And interestingly enough, um, I, I challenge everybody to look up the hazard communication section of that regulation and look at the inspection requirement that OSHA requires 
It goes very, very far into requiring the building owner to inspect and then have that information pass all the way down from bidders to the one who wins the bid, to his or her employees, to uh, visitors. It's, it's a huge right to know hazard communication requirement. And I, I wish more people knew about that because it, it essentially almost surpasses the AHERA inspection requirements as well as the NESHAP, asbestos NESHAP ones. A lot of states on this particular uh, uh, webinar have state specific or even local asbestos regulations. Sometimes even the landfill has nerdy requirements that go beyond what the regulations have. So before you enact a, a response action in your school, you wanna make sure that you are determining whether or not an asbestos project permit or abatement project permit is applicable. Um, you know, like in Wyoming, whether or not you have to put waste inside a containerized drum and what other things that might, might affect um, ma uh, maintaining compliance with the regulations. So it's not just the HERA regulations, but you might have other regulations you may have to reckon with. The reason why I put up the next dot is relying on old sample analytical results is that for many years, when floor tile and mastic samples were collected, a lot of times initially in the HERA, when HERA came about, a lot of people just assumed flooring was positive for asbestos. And that's all well and good, as long as you manage the material in place, you're not scuffing it up and, and following pr uh, proper work procedures for cleaning and buffing that material. But a lot of times what I found is that initially when samples were collected back in the 80s and the early 90s, we weren't, the laboratories weren't using ashing or ways of uh, chemical degradation or solvents to ash away the vinyl matrix or the asphalt matrix. And in a lot of cases, we weren't seeing the very small short asbestos fibers that typically make up uh, older ceiling or uh, floor tiles. And in a lot of schools um, erroneously uh, believe that a lot of their older flooring is non-asbestos. And in a lot of cases, that's far from the truth. So what we found when schools were doing renovations in, in our asbestos control program, we, tip, we typically would contact the school and have them verify the content of asbestos in these flooring materials before they enacted um, work on those materials. Um, in 1994, I believe it was, the interim PLM method came out and that really guided laboratories to do a much more thorough job at analyzing materials. Going on with more talk about uh, vinyl asbestos tile, this particular interpretation is, is a really good interpretation and I encourage you to look at that. A lot of people, when you look at the definition of regulated asbestos containing materials in the asbestos NESHAP regulation, it only breaks out a handful of activities that make category one non friables in which floor tile is included and linoleum for that matter. It only breaks out maybe four or five definitions within the asbestos NESHAP um, that are prohibited. But when you look at some of those def definitions, or definitions within those five definitions, there are other things that may be prohibited as well. So, um, and I'd have to look at the regulations specifically to see what those those are, but things like grinding um, that you wouldn't see in the regular uh, category one non-friable uh, Rackham definition. So you really need to pay attention to that. Another thing we ran into a lot of times, and I think a lot of states or a lot of people across the United States, uh, is being familiar with zonalite or vermiculite that was mined in Libby area, mined and milled for that matter. A lot of times the zonalite, which is the trade name for vermiculite um, that was born a long, long time ago, and the WR Grace kept that name for their trademark uh, vermiculite attic insulation. But a lot of times zonalite was poured into CMU block walls. Um, and if you use typical polarized light microscopy, a lot of times you may not find those small fibers in the sample of vermiculite. So you may be, it would behoove you to do transmission electron microscopy. Right now that's kind of a conundrum because it's not required in a lot of states like Montana to test certain materials like zonalite other than using polarized light microscopy. And being involved in a situation where a school has failed to adequately characterize that material and now is facing angry parents and possibilities of exposing building occupants as well as students, that's not a fun opportunity. 
So I encourage schools and any building material um, owner for that matter, if you're dealing with vermiculite or zonalite, that you want to use something more specific than just regular old PLM analysis to look for asbestos in those materials um, in vermiculite, or just assume that it contains asbestos and deal with it appropriately. Lastly, um, what we found in many cases when I ran the asbestos control program is that a lot of schools wanted to use the AHERA asbestos inspection to satisfy EPA asbestos NESHAP regulations or OSHA regulations. But there are certain things like um, AHERA didn't really um, hype up on collecting samples of exterior building materials such as roofing, asphalt roofing and those sorts of materials or soffit or fascia. So when roofing contractors were working or regulated under the asbestos NESHAP, and didn't have any sample analytical results, or maybe it wasn't, uh, maybe those materials weren't adequately uh, characterized in the AHERA inspection that they wanted to use, um, then in a lot of cases, citations were issued. So sometimes the AHERA inspection doesn't go as far as what's needed to satisfy the asbestos NESHAP or OSHA regulations. Next slide, please. All right, there are a ton of resources available, and this is just a smattering. Um, we could write a whole book on the resources that are available to everybody uh, for dealing with asbestos in schools. So I want to thank uh, again the uh, Hero Center for for Excellence and um, Cara and uh, Kristen for introducing us. And uh, this concludes my talk. Okay, thank you so much, John. That was so informative. Um, we really appreciate your perspective and um, all that you have to uh, bring to the discussion. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a break, a five minute break. So go refill your coffee, uh, do what you need to do, and just meet back here in five minutes. And then we're going to hear from Annette, and she's going to talk to us about that management plan. Hi everyone. Um, we are uh, the break. It, we thank you for returning back from your break. We are about to begin um, Annette's portion of the training, where she is going to take a deep dive into the management plan. Again, housekeeping: please turn off your camera and mute your phones or or computer. Thank you very much. And Annette, I am going to pull up your presentation. And um, thank you, John, for for all that you've contributed. And we look forward to answering um, your questions at the end of Annette's presentation. Perfect, thank you so very much. Um, really, we just put up the first slide because it was pretty. Go ahead and head to the next slide, Cara, thank you. <laughs> AHERA is what we like to refer to as living legislation. The management plan covers all of that material. There are different rhymes to help us remember that. Cradle to grave, birth to earth, womb to tomb. Basically, in that book, in that document, we cover from when the asbestos was discovered in the building to when it is put into a landfill and sometimes even beyond that. Um, next slide, please. It is your asbestos dogma. It is all important. Guard it very, very carefully. Please do not allow disgruntled employees to steal it or destroy it. Unfortunately, this happens. A few years ago, I was sent a clip of a superintendent who was burning it in a bonfire in the middle of a football field. That is years of information that cannot be replaced. Next slide, please. <laughs> Let's take a step back. If you are speaking with any inspector or management planner, there are certain ways that you can definitely make their head explode. The first is to tell them that asbestos does not exist. It most certainly does. It is a naturally occurring element and it is found in many locations on its own. It is also still being used in products today. They are making products within the United States. We are also importing it from many other countries. So anytime that something is added to the building, please get paperwork stating that it does not contain any asbestos. This will save you in the long run. Next slide, please.
the management plan. It is a public document. It can be read by the public when requested. The public may not remove the book from the building. Rules on copying those do documents will be set up by policy and procedures within the district. And it's not a bad idea to have lawyers look at that. Um, I know in many of our schools, you're allowed to copy it if you pay so much per copy, et cetera, but that book is not allowed to leave the building. Next slide, please. What goes into the management plan? Quite simply, everything that is done regarding asbestos. Uh, unfortunately, I have seen many plans that are kept like the two pictures on the side here. Uh, please do try to keep them a little more organized than that. Next slide, please. There will be a lot of information and it will grow as time goes on. And some of the buildings that I work with, depending on the size of the district, the building, et cetera, it may be one three ring binder. Uh, in one of the buildings that I work with, it is eight shelves and it is kept in its own room. Please do not throw it into a box or a drawer. Please catalog it and keep it with some, some clarity. Uh, the best that I have seen are in three ring binders and each building has their own binder. Uh, there is usually two copies of every report. There is one in an office with every building. If it is a district with multiple buildings, then each building has their own book and it should be kept on site. Next slide, please. What's kept in the plan? Uh, there is a lot of information here and we will touch on each one a little bit as we go through this this next time period any general information on asbestos designated person information inspector information information on sampling or assuming asbestos containing building materials the analysis of samples the physical assessment information response actions information on remaining asbestos after response actions information on any future activities information on required notifications the periodic surveillance inspection reports, cost estimates on how much response actions may be, any consultant information, and of course, optional information. Next slide, please. The general information. Most of them will have a list of the name and address of all the school buildings. Whether that school building contains friable asbestos containing building material, non-friable, or material that has been assumed to contain asbestos. Many of them will contain all three. You may have friable, non-friable, and assumed all in the building at the same time. In many of the books, it, they will also list the age of the building or any respective additions, uh, the square footage of each section, and any type of heating element in that area. The heating element can be important. Uh, it tells us oftentimes one, if there might be asbestos involved in that heating element. It also helps us to determine uh, how easily the material could be spread depending uh, on problems. If something were to break, delaminate, et cetera, uh, forced air is going to move things throughout the room much easier than say electric heat will do. Next slide, please. One more. Thank you. The designated person information, it will have your name, address, telephone number, email address, any way for them to get a hold of you, ideally 24 seven, uh, because things do occur at odd times of the day. The course name, dates and hours of training taken by the designated person. This training will count toward that and you would list that somewhere in that book. And a certificate or a copy of certificate of training if that is available. Next slide, please. The inspector information. Uh, in the bottom right hand corner is one of my old accreditation cards. Uh, this may be included right in reports, uh, whether it be the inspection, the management plan, et cetera. But you should have the information from the inspector. Uh, name and a signature, any date of inspection or reinspection, and a state and accreditation number of each accredited person uh, making that inspection or reinspection, and ideally a copy of their accreditation. 
Uh, and there may be more than one person involved, uh, depending on the size of the building, et cetera. One person, it could take them a month to do what maybe a team of four could do. So if there are more, more people involved, we need the, the information for all of them. Next slide, please. Information on sampling and assumed asbestos containing building materials. I do like to see blueprints. Uh, granted, many of them are large and do not fit nicely into a drawer or a three ring binder. There is there, there are ways now to shrink them and put them into that material. Other diagrams work, written descriptions of each school building that clearly identifies where homogeneous areas are and where materials were sampled. The exact location, ideally, of where those samples were located the date and collection of each bulk sample, the homogeneous area where the friable sus or suspected ACM, ACBM is assumed, uh, homogeneous areas where non-friable asbestos is assumed, description of the manner used to determine sampling locations. Most of us use a grid. Uh, to be fair, it is supposed to be random sampling. We could take a diagram of the room, slide a grid over it and pick where those samples will be. I, as random as we want them to be, I also like to be as less in destructive as possible. I, I'm not going to go in and take a slide, take a sample right out of the middle of a gym floor. Uh, this could cause other tripping hazards, etc. I can get as good of a sample next to a wall, along an edge, somewhere where it will be a little less critical to aesthetic and safety. Uh, name and signature of each accredited inspector collecting the samples. And again, the state of accreditation and accreditation numbers. Next slide, please. The analysis of samples. Uh, you are going to need copies of the analysis of the bulk samples collected. And again, where those samples were collected. The name and address of the laboratory. The state that the, the state that the laboratory uses or meets the accreditation requirements under the AHERA rule. Now you will want to see MVLAP somewhere on that document. It stands for the National Voluntary Laboratory Accreditation Program, and this is the standard that they are asked to meet. Uh, you will need any date that the analysis was performed and the name and signature of the person or persons performing each analysis. The lab that I use uses two different uh, individuals on those microscopes. Uh, most times both of them will take a look at it to make sure that they're seeing the same thing. Both of their names and signatures will be on that document when I receive it back and put it back into those plans. Next slide, please. The physical assessment information. As John stated, there, there are actually five uh, different areas on how to assess them that are required by the AHERA rule. Those assessments will be determined by the inspector. Uh, by their determination, they hand that information to the management planner, who then decides what to do with that information. Uh, the name and the signature, again, of each accredited person making the assessment and everything about their accreditation is required. Next slide, please. Thank you. Response action information. Uh, recommendations made to the LEA by an accredited management planner regarding the response actions will be in this section. This is one of those things that can be a little different with these standards. The LEA will be the district itself, whether it be the school board, uh, administration, uh, etc. The management plan will speak directly to them in making the recommendations or give them this documentation, etc. But the original assessment will come from the inspector. So it goes inspector to the management planner, back to the LEA. I am both an inspector and a management planner. It is not considered a conflict of interest uh, for me to make the assessment and the recommendation. Uh, and to be fair, a lot of times it's easier. I'm the one seeing it. I then can interpret what I saw. Again, the name and signature of each person is required in those books, state and accreditation. The detailed description of preventative measures and response actions to be taken. 
uh, including any methods to be used for any friable ACM, ACBM. Uh, this may say something like use operation and maintenance to maintain it in good condition. Uh, this material needs to be repaired. It needs to be encapsulated, enclosed, or it might be to a point where you have to abate it. Uh, it may need to come out. Uh, locations where such measures and actions will be taken will be listed. Reasons for selecting that response at, or preventative measure will be listed and schedule for beginning and completing each preventative measure and response action will be listed in the document. Information on any remaining asbestos after the response action. In many cases, not all of the asbestos will be removed. You may have a boiler room where we are, for whatever reason, abating the boiler. Maybe we're getting, <laughs> And, and again, my mind goes in many different directions and I apologize, but many of you may have ESSR funds that could be used toward up, updating or upgrading your ventilation systems. This may mean getting rid of an old boiler. In that area, you could remove the asbestos from the boiler, have that abated, et cetera, to cut it up and remove it, but you may not remove the asbestos in the crawl spaces that connect to that area. With that, those crawl spaces would still need to be outlined to show that asbestos is still present and in the building. Next slide, please. Information on future activities. Uh, your management planner should give you an idea as to a plan for the next reinspection. We try to keep all of ours within a three month window on our three year inspection. I, unfortunately, COVID has us a little behind the gun on that one, but that, that is our ideal. Uh, there is a place in there for operation and maintenance. This is going to be covered more in one of your future sessions in this class. There is a plan for periodic surveillance, a description of the management planner, or a description of what their recommendations are going to be for additional cleaning. Uh, after things occur, there might be different things in place. Uh, to be fair, part of those recommendations were under the original inspection where no one had looked for asbestos to begin with. And they would come in and say, Oof, it's here, but the area is dusty. We're, it may or may not be asbestos dust. This is what we need to do to clean it. Now, hopefully, if there are being uh, abatement projects and things done, air clearances will be done, different cleaning will be maintained, etc. Unfortunately, mistakes do happen. And if something were to be removed improperly, etc., the management planner will walk you through how to clean that area and what steps need to be taken to clean that area. Uh, and again, the response of the LEA to any recommendations for additional cleaning cleaning. When it all comes down to it, the management plan is making recommendations. It is up to the LEA to make sure that those recommendations are completed or followed or, or to decide. Um, they may look at it and say, oh, okay, yeah, uh, we don't have the money for that right now. We might have to close off this room completely and then get to it. Um, those decisions will come to the LEA. Next slide, please. Information on required notifications. As John stated numerous times uh, in his section of the presentation, you do need to notify the public, the occupants of the building, uh, any short term workers, etc., about the presence of asbestos within the building. Or if asbestos has been removed, we need to re inform them of that as well. The people in this that need the most information, in my personal opinion, would be the parents. They have a huge concern about what is happening in the building. And to be fair, they have every right to know uh, what is my child in? Are, is the building in a safe condition, et cetera? So long as these can be printed, they can act as a notification, uh, whether it be a web page, a handbook, a newspaper. Uh, John stated a, a union form for the employees, but they do all have to be printed, dated, and put back into that management plan. Again, this is a way to prove that people were notified. 
Next slide, please. The periodic surveillance. Usually this is done every six months by the designated person. It may be conducted more frequently. I, I do believe that in the standard it does say six months. Uh, I have a number of schools that do them usually over the summer and again over a winter break. Uh, some do, do them every three months. Uh, one gentleman looks at things every month. He feels more sure of it and wants to look at it. For the notations that you are making, while you are the person that is handling that book, if for whatever reason someone else gets a hold of that book, please make sure that the notations are phrased in such a way that confusion cannot happen. Um, with this, uh, it was about eight years ago now, the designated person was in the process of retiring. The principal in the school building thought they were helping took the management plan to talk to one of the abatement contractors. And as they were going through, pages were not completely documented as they moved over. And all it said on the top was yes, no. On the page before it, it said, is there any change in condition? Yes or no. All the principal saw was floor tile and no. What that meant was there was no change in that floor tile. How he interpreted that was that there was no asbestos in that floor tile. Needless to say, the outcome was not desired. Uh, next slide, please. The cost estimate. This is getting more and more difficult, but if response actions are made, uh, advised, et cetera, the management planner should give you an estimate as to how much they believe that will cost. Uh, they will probably talk to different abatement contractors, et cetera. Um, most schools, though, are still on a bidding process. So with that, bids may be higher, bids may be lower. Uh, so unfortunately, this is usually a ballpark uh, amount. Next slide, please. Consultant information. Again, anyone that is going to touch your asbestos, we need names, phone numbers, accreditation certificates. Next slide, please. Optional information. If there is any doubt at all, please keep the information. Uh, it's better to have more information than not enough information. Uh, some of the things in the optional area might be legal information. Uh, they might be citations. They might be compliments. Uh, this was outstanding. Thank you for the job that you did. Uh, pictures may show up in this area. Pictures are a must. Uh, they are much easier to include in reports, presentations now than they were. Uh, many of them from the 1980s are Polaroids. Uh, depending on how they have been stored, they're starting to change colors. They're starting to crinkle. Um, but in addition to those pictures, please remember, ultimately, it is our future that we are protecting. We are protecting the children and the students in those buildings. Next slide, please. Needed paperwork that is often missing. Training certificates from employees partici participating in the two hour asbestos awareness training. Anyone that is trained, you should have that material listed. Um, both John and I have gone through two hour asbestos awareness training probably more times than we care to admit. Uh, both of us could probably wallpaper a house with some of those certificates, but we do have them uh, and they are in books if people should need them. Uh, paperwork signed by outside workers, such as your plumbers, electricians, carpenters, uh, some of your computer technicians might be in crawl spaces and running wires in different places. They might be up in the attic and disturbing different things. They need to be notified where that material is and they should sign off that they have been notified as to where that material is. Again, notification of the presence of ACBM to the public, to parents, etc. Unfortunately, is often missing. Uh, a lot of times people say, well, it's on the web page. That's fantastic, but we still need that in that management plan to be able to prove that that was uh, given to the public. Uh, next slide, please. The laboratory report. Uh, unfortunately, this is another one that many times will be missing. Uh, why? I don't know, but we do need proof of that accreditation 
and we need to know what those samples said. And future generations that will be reading that well past us might want to look back and say, oh, the ceiling tile was tested. They took adequate samples. It came back that there wasn't any asbestos in that material. Let's proceed. Or you may look back at it and say, oof, they only took one sample. It was done in the 80s. We don't know anything about the lab. Uh, let's resample. Let's find out for sure. Next slide, please. In the inspection, and I'm sure you will have more information on this coming forward, the original inspections were probably completed somewhere in the late 80s. If it was not, you will need a new one. Um, most things are based on that original inspection. It would have been conducted by an accredited asbestos inspector. That inspector will determine functional areas, which areas are being used uh, and accessed by which individuals in the building homogeneous areas within those functional areas. Um, in the room that John and I are sitting in, we would look at sheetrock, ceiling tile. Uh, there is carpeting in here. There would be mastic behind that carpeting. Having been in this room many times before, I know that there is floor tile under that carpeting, so we would look at that floor tile and mastic. Uh, basically, every material in the room is going to be considered a homogeneous area. Uh, you, they will determine the specific number of samples required for each type of material, and they will catalog it and put it in the report. There are only three substances that are considered non-suspect, wood, steel, or glass. As irreverent as this may be, if we were to walk in and there is nice wood trim in this room, I'm sure you can see it in the slide, we would look at that and say wood, bless it and move on. That one we wouldn't have to sample. Again, glass windows, any steel. Anything else needs to be sampled and determined or assumed to contain asbestos. Um, when in doubt, that material will contains asbestos until it is, can be sampled to determine otherwise. Next slide, please. The inspection report to the management planner. Again, after the inspection, Vector goes through and makes the assessment. They will hand that information off to the management planner. The management planner then reads this information and determines whether to use operation and maintenance. A lot of times this is maintaining it in place and keeping it in good condition as it moves forward. To repair that information, encapsulate that information, enclose it, or to remove and abate it. Uh, the LEA designated person keeps up the plan and maintains the paperwork as it comes back. Um, again, it is your book. Keep it close to you. Um, do not lose it. Um, many for There was a, a window in time when it was believed the best action was to abate at all cost. Uh, since that time period, it is now believed, actually, if you can maintain it in place, it is just as safe and just as healthy as some of the other things. Again, it will, determine, it will depend on the assessment of that material. But personally, I like to view asbestos as a sleeping bear. I know it is there, and I'm going to proceed with caution. If I decide to poke it with a stick, I better have a pretty good plan in place as to what to do with it once it wakes up and that will come from operation, repair, encapsulate, enclose, and remove. Next slide, please. A project designer is the person who designs the response action. They must be accredited as a project designer, and they are the crew that's going to come in and say, you need to enclose this area. We will put air tunnels here, uh, et cetera. Next slide, please. The final air clearance and response actions. As stated earlier, air clearance should be conducted by a professional consultant or air monitoring firm. This company should be different than the company who conducted the removal. Um, it should not be the same company. As, as, Sean state, as John stated, we do not want the, the fox guarding the hen house. Uh, next slide, please. Other problems and items missing from the plans. Uh, depending on who you are following in, the location of homogeneous areas may not be clearly defined or described clearly. Uh, it may say something like 
Mrs. Sullivan's second grade room from 1969. Mrs. Sullivan has not taught the second grade since 1969, and there have been many changes. Uh, needless to say, it's difficult to find that room now. Uh, the material classification may be incorrect. Uh, oftentimes, I find surfacing and miscellaneous are, are mixed up. Thermal system insulation is pretty straightforward. Um, most people can look at it and go, TSI. But uh, every now and again, I will see floor tile listed as surfacing. Now, floor tile is miscellaneous, and there are others that may switch back and forth. Unfortunately, many of these books are not user friendly. I am an engineer by training. I have been told that speaking with an engineer is only slightly more difficult than speaking with the dead. To be fair, I probably write that way as well. Uh, as the material comes back to you, read it. Ask them questions. Make sure that it makes sense to you. It is your document and you need to know how to use it. Make sure that final air sample clearances and their locations are in those management plans. Uh, again, please remember that this legislation is living legislation. We need to update it routinely. Uh, there should be a, at, at least two periodic surveillance forms in that management plan for every year, one every six months. Uh, the reinspections every three years. Any identification informa information and certificates for anyone who has touched the material should be in that book. Uh, we have found now that insufficient numbers of samples might have been taken. Uh, those, those could be problems going forward. Uh, walking through the building warning signs may be missing. Warning signs are absolutely mandated in mechanical areas, uh, on the TSI, on boilers, on doorways going into boiler rooms, uh, into those mechanical areas. You do not need to have a warning asbestos sticker on the floor tile in every room. Um, honestly, this will cause more problems than not. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but they are needed in those mechanical areas. Other things that are often left out are, are areas that people don't realize are part of the inspection, uh, whether that be a portable building. Uh, if it is used to teach students and in the education of students, that portable building becomes part of the AHERA and under the AHERA regulation, as do modular units. In Montana, we have a number of Hutterite Colony schools some of them are standalone school districts. Some of them, the closest public district next to them provides a teacher. Once a teacher is provided, the classroom in that colony becomes part of the AHERA standard. Um, administration buildings, where there may not be students, but we do have staff, they are part of the AHERA standard. Next slide, please. Things I would recommend and would not recommend, and I'm sure John has a lot of ideas on this as well. Please only use trained people to remove asbestos. Uh, people should have special training and accreditation for that. They should be at least an asbestos worker before they're allowed to remove asbestos. Uh, even removing it yourself, make sure that you have the proper training, proper equipment, et cetera, to do that. Please do not ask visiting regulators for a search warrant. It is your right to do so, but I can guarantee the inspection is not going to be pleasant after that. Unfortunately, we have had people ask the EPA for search warrants. Um, please do not tell the regulator that you know that they're only there to justify whatever vacation activity they might be doing. Um, here in Montana, we've had people offer up fishing and hunting locations and a map and say, here, please go away. <laughs> please do not do that. Uh, they do have a job. They are there to look at specific things. Uh, please grant them the respect that you want them to grant you. Ideally, please do the right thing even when no one is watching. And if there is any doubt, please err on the side of caution. Joan, is there anything you'd like to add to that? 
No, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Kristen, for allowing us to speak today. Thank you all of you for joining in and putting up with us. We realize it is very early. Um, we are available for, for questions. Right. This is Christina. We have plenty of questions as well. <laughs> so that was in the chat. So um, earlier in the chat for John, someone asked, can you cover when a non fireable ACM floor towel becomes fireable during removal? What size pieces would make it friable? If, if you go back to the asbestos niche app and look at the definition of RACM in the definitions, I think it's 61.141. Um, it talks about uh, floor tile being a category one non friable. And if you cut, grind, drill, abrade, there's a litany of, of activities that if you do those activities on asbestos containing floor tile, then you would render them regulated under the asbestos niche app. Um, my recommendation, and frankly, when you look at the asbestos niche app, you can interpret that as long as that non friable material never becomes regulated, then the niche app doesn't apply. The asbestos niche app doesn't apply unless you're doing a building demolition. So you can remove flooring, floor tile, using what's called the Resilient Floor Covering Institute's recommended work practices for the removal of floor tile or resilient floor coverings. And that entails two trained individuals removing each tile intact and following proper work practices. That sort of activity would most likely not lead to making flooring regulated, um, but the competent person, the 40 hour trained person that would be supervising those two individuals, or maybe one of the people are actually one of the competent people, they would have the opportunity to, to explain or stop work if the flooring was breaking up um, and then follow other work practices to, to prohibit that sort of work. Um, but yeah, when we get into the little bits and pieces, uh, Rich, um, Rick uh, in the last presentation had a really good picture of broken up floor tile. Um, but I have to admit, um, um, in, enforcing the asbestos niche app when it comes to flooring uh, can be kind of difficult because in some cases there's been a lot of subjectivity to the decisions being made. Um, but every situation should be handled on a case by case situation. This question's from James. Um, he says the term response action is defined as the method including removal, encapsulation, enclosure, repair, ONM that protects human health and environment from friable ACBM. Therefore, do response actions only involve friable ACBM and non friable ACBM that would become friable during abatement? In other words, if an a LEA removes ACBM from a school that is not friable and does not become friable during removal, is that a response action? I would say that it is. Uh, be just because it is non friable does not mean that proper procedures, et cetera, should not be taken while removing it. Uh, so then once it was decided to remove that material, it would become an abatement project. Uh, that abatement is a response. Uh, that is how I would interpret that. John, what, what do you think? I agree. I think I think you could argue that, you know, removing non friables non friably is not covered as a response action. But, you know, the, the regulation is is I hate to say this. It's it's it's. It, it's old, it's dated, <laughs> and I think the, the industry has matured immensely and uh, and rightfully so. So I, I would err on the side of caution and call it a response action and have appropriate people deal with it, not allowing anybody to deal with it. Plus you have OSHA regulations that would regulate it under class two work activities and requirements Absolutely. under the OSHA standard. So and different different states, different areas may have different clean air uh, standards, et cetera, that may be more stringent than this. Um, also in my thinking, you need to be able to say what happened to that asbestos from the moment it was identified. So you are still going to need information on where did it go? 
Um, so again, that in my mind would make it a response action to be able to trace it and con follow it through to to its death, if you will. All righty then, thank you for that answer. Um, let me see. So uh, Ken asks, can a triannual inspection start before the triannual inspection required date to collect the data? Uh, like a triannual inspection? Right, the three-year reinspection. Oh, I see, I see. Can it start before that? The, the the initial really would be the initial inspection would be the data gathering, if if you will. So that would be the first one, and then every three years we would get a reinspection. Um, as far as other things gathered before that first inspection, absolutely gather uh, blueprints, uh, other plans of the buildings, um, leases maybe to to different areas if you if you are leasing or renting areas that might be classrooms etc to know where people need to be um, beyond that i'm not sure i'm understanding the question all righty then i i think that sort of answers the question <laughs> um but if ken's still on he can uh, Anne has commented that um Please reiterate that the Anhara inspection does not always meet the standards for niche shop inspections. Yeah, the Anhara inspection requirements were specific to uh, satisfy Anhara requirements, whereas the thorough asbestos inspection, as mentioned in the asbestos niche app, is to satisfy the asbestos niche app. Inspections that are done for OSHA purposes or state specific regulations are done that way. Um, and it can be very confusing. Um, and that's why it's imperative that school districts, that uh, building owners, um, operators hire the most competent people that they can afford. <laughs> because in this particular world, we know how liability is. And if, not necessarily if, but when you find yourself in court, you want to be able to have the best person that's going to be defending or helping you defend yourself. You know, having an appropriately accredited laboratory, um, you know, hiring good contractors, good consultants. Um, yeah, because liability can really be a real stinger. <laughs> right. And that is all the questions uh, for John. Now, here's some questions for Annette. I'll try to get through them quickly since we have two minutes. Annette, a few people have asked or commented that records often get lost when the designated person retires. What do you do if you can't find any of these records? You do the best you can to move forward. Uh, start start at that position. Document things the best that you possibly can. Um, please do not make up information to, to fill in any holes. Uh, I, I believe that that's worse than having the hole. I uh, document it, it is gone. We don't know where it went. Uh, and move forward the best you possibly can. Uh, keep them up from that, that moment forward. All right, thank you for that. Um, a, a couple of uh, people have also commented and asked questions uh, regarding having the management plan as a digital copy. Um, some have said that um, do, do some of the LAAs need to go back to do an all paper documentation, even though they have everything under a digital copy? You should be fine. So long as you can put your hand on it, uh, print it, allow someone else to read it, it should be just fine. Uh, again, please remember the standard we are referring to was written before a lot of our personal computers. Um, they, they had no idea that we would be able to digitize them moving forward. Are also paper documents only required uh, with wet signatures in the management plan? I would have everything signed. I uh, you can you can photocopy a signature, uh, scan them in, etc. I I would have everything signed. Wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, and then uh, regarding costs. Um, for managing asbestos and LEA. Are costs required in the management plan or any documentation regarding costs need to be in the management plan? 
I would recommend that they are they are in there. Um, if nothing else, it holds everyone's feet to the fire on, look, <laughs> when our management plan talked to you, you said it would be uh, $10,000 a square foot. Why is it now $100,000 a square foot? Um, both of those are extremely exaggerated numbers, um, but it, it does allow some backup on different things. Right, and since it looks like our time is up, there's still a couple more questions, but I'll let Kara uh, continue to wrap up this conversation on how to get in contact with our state partners and EPA representatives to have these questions answered. Yes, and thank you, um, Annette, and thank you so much, John. I mean, you guys, you've just contributed so much to this training, just your expertise and background and your stories and your advice, the whole fox in the hen, I just can totally relate and understand that. So thank you so much. Christina, thank you for moderating the Q&A. Um, just to follow up, um, and Christina, if she hasn't already, um, she's going to post in the chat ways to contact us if you have questions um, for, about um, concerning what you learned today or in the future as you go back to your positions. You can reach us either by um, contacting EPA Asbestos Ombudsman, and you have the link there, as well as you have heard um, both John and Annette say multiple times that um, oftentimes that you have, you may have separate state requirements, plus you, it's probably good to get to know your state contact. So you've got the link there to the state contact. Also, um, part three will be, to, uh, for this four part series, will be on August 26th at one o'clock Central Standard Time. If you haven't registered already, I encourage you uh, to do so. All right, um, with that said, thank you all so much for joining us today and um, look forward to seeing you at the next training.